Alrighty, thank, thanks very much for coming along today uh, to the SETI Institute. Uh, today we're uh, being visited by Rosalind Grimes. Dr. Grimes is over at uh, NASA Ames and uh, she uh, is a former uh, Deputy Director of the NAI um, and the current director has just entered the room, so isn't that fortuitous? Uh, and uh, Rose is now uh, uh, in charge of the uh, Advanced Studies Laboratory uh, partnership between uh, UC Santa Cruz and uh, NASA Reims. She's going to mostly address that subject today, so um, I welcome, or if you'll join me in welcoming uh, Rose, Rose Grimes. Thanks. So thanks SETI, SETI audience, the people that I can see here and the people who can see me but I can't see, or who will see me later, I gather. It's really nice to have this kind of uh, opportunity to tell you about what I'm doing now. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen many of you, but I still certainly think of you as friends and colleagues, and it's nice to see that that feeling is, um, comes the other direction, too, and I can tell you about what I'm doing these days. I also have brought along a couple of takeaways, a two-pager, of course, the classic way that uh, NASA activities have of explaining to the outside world what they're doing. It's not as slick as the various kinds of outreach materials that SETI Institute does about its work, which are really fabulous. But here it is, and I need to advertise that I'm on loan from NASA to the University of California, Santa Cruz. And so, although I still seem to have all of the disadvantages of being a civil servant, I still am viewed as an employee of the university for the period of time that I'm with them and for this, for this purpose and this project. So I put these things over on the far table so that any of those of you who need to leave before the classical end of the lecture, you can pick it up without feeling like you're disturbing me by coming to the front of the room. So go ahead and grab one of those if you'd like. So the Advanced Studies Laboratories is a partnership between NASA Ames and UC Santa Cruz, but it also, by its nature, encompasses the participation of what you might call third parties. Other academic nonprofit institutions, also uh, potentially industrial partners. And as a uh, uh, coincidence, I just got my first application from an industrial partner to join, the, to join the Advanced Studies Laboratories yesterday afternoon. So we seem to be moving forward with doing that kind of thing. So I've brought you a flavor of what the ASL is. I hope that it won't actually take a lot of your time, because I'd like to address questions and hear more about what your interests in the Advanced Studies Laboratories might be. Uh, we have had one of your colleagues join the Advanced Studies Laboratories through her SETI Institute connection, Bin Chan, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. So there already has been a collaboration between SETI Institute and the Advanced Studies Laboratories. So here you see what we're, what we're about, what the partnership is about. Uh, the vision is to create a first of its kind strategic alliance between these two entities. One of them a uh, federal agency, arguably at the forefront of research and engineering, and the other a state-supported uh, premier educational institution and the leading provider of university-level research and education opportunities in the state of California, which is, were it not considered only as part of the union, it would be one of the fourth largest economies in the world. So clearly those two organizations have potentially a great deal in common, although clearly both organizations also have rather extensive corporate structures and unique and individual histories that have led them to operate in the way that they do and to develop internal ways of thinking about themselves and their mission, their procedures, and those are not always coincident. And so bringing these two organizations together to do something productive, even when they have, in some cases, shared goals and shared capabilities, facilities, expertise, is not a trivial undertaking. The mission is to implement that vision of putting these two organizations together by actually operating or co-operating facilities which are actually in Building 239 on the NASA campus. And so you might imagine that having these two organizations partner together and undertake these activities on a federal facility would also lead to some interesting and unique opportunities for learning. And I thought it would be very useful to give you a picture of where the Advanced Studies Laboratories fits in the scheme of exchanges between the University of California, Santa Cruz, and NASA Ames, so that you could put this in context. So 
UC Santa Cruz has a, an activity. It's not exactly a department. It's not a school like the School of Engineering. And I've tried to figure out in the organization what it is they would like to call themselves. And honestly, I can't figure it out. So let's say it has an arm of interest in Silicon Valley, and it calls itself Silicon Valley Initiatives. And there is, in fact, a vice provost who is in charge of Silicon Valley Initiatives. And currently, the vice provost is Joe Miller, who was previously a director of uh, UC Lick Observatory. So Joe's background is in uh, astronomy and astrophysics. UC Silicon Valley Initiatives, I guess I don't, do I have a pointer or a? I can use, oh, but I shouldn't mistake it and use it for oh. anything else. Well, okay, right. well, we'll see what we can do. All right. So Silicon Valley Initiatives has within it, then, a variety of other activities. The Advanced Studies Labs is one. The BioInfo Nano Research and Development Institute is another. And I, and I can ask, answer questions about that. I, I don't want to go into too much detail on any one. But if you're interested, I certainly can. There are academic programs, and there is the university-affiliated research contract, the UARC. And I suspect that that's something that more of you have heard of than the various other aspects of it. Uh, then this whole entity is partnered with AIMS in considering development of the NASA Research Park. And some of its activities are already resident in the NASA Research Park. So the Silicon Valley Academic Programs and the UARC and the offices of Silicon Valley Initiatives are located in Building 19 in what is currently the NASA Research Park. But there is also an effort underway to develop a further area of the NASA Research Park campus, about 70 acres. And that I'll talk about at the end of my presentation, again, if you're, if you're interested. And I thought that some of you might have heard about some of these ongoing activities and you'd want to know a little bit more about them. So this is where we exist in context. The Advanced Studies Laboratories is not part of the UARC, nor are any of these other things. They're all independent entities. You might call them sister organizations. So the UARC is a sister organization to the Advanced Studies Laboratories. Uh, and in some cases, they may share some personnel who support university activities who are employed by Silicon Valley initiatives like human resources personnel and financial people, procurement, stuff like that. These are partners in a variety of activities. They partner, for example, Carnegie Mellon, I know, partners in some of the Silicon Valley academic programs. I believe that most of these, I think San Jose State University, last I heard, was still negotiating. But most of these are partners in the effort to develop the NASA Research Park further. So they are among, and this isn't, a, this isn't the all-inclusive list of partners in various activities that you see uh, pursues in Silicon Valley or on the NASA Research Park campus. But again, that's, it's actually a good illustration that I don't know is because some of those things go forward with the other, my sister organizations, and I don't do them, so I can't exactly tell you what they're partnered on at that level of detail. OK, so here's a timeline. And I bet that Carl and Ed recognize the, the figure, although it's not unique to NAI. But it's certainly um, this arrow of time is something that I borrowed from the Astrobiology Institute and plugged in all of my information. So the uh, effort to partner together in a concept called the Advanced Studies Labs predates me. I joined this activity, you can see me on the bottom, in late 2006. And before that, there had been a variety of discussions. Uh, and I don't know whether any of you have heard about this, but some of the people that I interact with have heard about the Advanced Studies Labs based on some of that prior information. And it's not always accurate with what's actually happening today. So in the early days, just after the university affiliated research contract was awarded, and this is a large contract. It's now a 10-year contract. It's in its third year. It burns about $25 million a year. So it's a substantial activity. Once the university associated uh, university affiliated research contract was awarded, Santa Cruz and Ames started to think about what other things they could do together. And one of the concepts that came up, they came up with was this BioInfo Nano Research and Development Institute. That's an interesting idea. The School of Engineering at Santa Cruz had adopted the mantra of BioInfo Nano, and I'm sure many of you know that NASA Ames had adopted the mantra of BioInfo Nano as something that explained uniquely what was uh, the contribution that Ames could make to, to the agency. To, that, to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Uh, so that's one activity that they were working on. And in the end, that became uh, a funded grant. So then they had 
a large contract, a significant cooperative agreement grant of mutual interest, and they began to think about what third leg could they put to that three-legged stool. And there are examples in the agency, uh, mostly um, with JPL and universities associated with Langley, of a university field center relationship where there are all three kinds of partnerships, of mechanisms, contracts, grants, and Space Act agreements. And so around this time, 2005, Ames and Santa Cruz began to consider what kind of Space Act agreement they could craft to work together to provide yet a third leg of flexibility for times when the contract wasn't the appropriate mechanism and the grant wasn't the appropriate mechanism where they could still partner together to achieve all of their goals. And this is when the Advanced Studies Labs concept was floated. In the early discussions, there were thoughts about making it um, at least self-sustaining in a financial way. S uh, and uh, again, the focus was on Building 239, so there were thoughts about how spaces could be, could be leased, how UC Santa Cruz could act in some way as the, the managing director of the spaces and then lease them to other entities, a whole variety of things. Predates me, can't tell you the details about it. Um, from my own background, of course, I've been with NASA for the last 17 years. I know how to give money away. I know how to spend money. But I don't think that I could make a profit to save my life. So that would not be my particular expertise, how to make Building 239 a productive cost center. And that wasn't the direction that uh, I initially took when I was presented with the challenge uh, and asked whether I'd be interested in starting something new yet again. Uh, there was also an Umbrella Space Act agreement completed in August 2006, but it was one of those Space Act agreements that was so general about how we were going to love each other and play nicely together that it really wasn't useful to do anything. It didn't say what we would do together. It just said that we'd make nice. Well, so we started out then in 2006, and as you see, since then we've uh, achieved a lot of things. We've negotiated a variety of the core uh, questions about how these two organizations are going to partner together. And I, let me see what my next slide might have on it. This is a list of the affiliates that we have today. Um, so I think, let me leave you looking at the timeline while I tell you some aspects of the partnership that are unique. Organizations get into partnership together for a whole variety of reasons. And sometimes it happens you know, in a discussion uh, at the country club or in the men's room, rarely in the women's room, but sometimes in the men's room. Sometimes it happens because one partner sees that they have a gap something that they can't do, that they're looking for somebody else to help them do. Um, a variety of goals. In business, and probably more partnerships are done in business than in any other sense. Yeah, nonprofits and academic institutions partner together, but often in the sense that I described that 2006 Umbrella Space Act Agreement in ways that describe that we'll play nicely together, but they're not so focused on a bottom line or an accomplishment or co-operating a facility. Um, but in, in business, people partner very frequently, and it's got a business plan. It's got a bottom line. Most of those partnerships fail. And studies show that they fail, by and large, because the partners didn't realize when they entered into that relationship that they were creating a new synergistic activity that would have to compromise with the procedures and the comfort boundaries of each parent organization. So the partnership is always pushing at the limits of what either parent organization could do and would feel comfortable doing by definition. If the parent organization could do it, it would. If the parent organization can't do it, well, that's why it enters into partnership. But that means that you're always in an uncomfortable place of doing something new. And uh, you're probably already interpreting through the back of your mind that the uncomfortable place in doing something you knew and NASA and UC doesn't really seem like a place that's going to flow along productively. Okay, but, but we have, and that I think is a very interesting outcome and learning point about partnerships, some of the ways that we've been able to do that. One of the very first challenges that we recognized, and we actually addressed this before we negotiated the Space Act Agreement. This is a challenge here and fence relocation and access agreement. And then be, you see this happens before the Space Act. Before we got involved in negotiating a Space Act, because I've been involved in Space Acts before, we tackled the toughest problem that lay between the two partners, and that was access. The initial idea before I came on board late 2006 was that Ames was going to move the fence 
Ames was going to put the Ames perimeter inside of where Building 239 is located, because moving the building was thought to be probably financially prohibitive. So they were going to move the fence to exclude Building 239 and place 239 into the NASA Research Park, where NASA has more experience with doing least kind of activities and dealing with third parties. So we had done all of the scripting, architecting, diagrams, discussions with employees, issues about handicapped access, where things were going to be delivered, how to prevent the skateboarders from killing themselves on the loading docks, all that kind of stuff was done in December of 2006. And we sent the job out for bid. And two things happened simultaneously. The bid came out way higher than anybody had thought, about three times, which is not actually so surprising. It surprises me that it surprised them, but it did. Uh, and the other thing that happened was Homeland Security <laughs> gave uh, all the federal agencies, including Ames, a variety of things that they needed to get done by November the following year, and the Ames Security Organization was hugely stressed to accomplish this with their existing budget. And so they were floating the idea of closing one of the gates. So the idea of spending three times as much to move a fence at a time when the security organization might very well be simply closing it was kind of nuts. So we decided not to go in that direction, but we still had the problem of access. I skipped ahead of myself a little bit. So what is the access problem? And it's mainly the access for foreign nationals. It's because to the university, access to research and educational opportunities should not be restricted by age, sex, gender, religion, sexual orientation, national origin. But to NASA, most of the others are fine, but f national origin is a big deal. NASA understands, NASA has valid reasons why for the agency, it's very important to restrict access based on considerations of national origin. And we needed to iron out that problem. And the first solution was moving the fence. That didn't work. So the second solution uh, came about when I sat down with the security organization and I asked them to redefine for me what the problem was. And they explained that the regulations require that any federal facility uh, has to follow the same badging instructions as any other and those say that foreign nationals have to go through a particular kind of review process. And so what we did was we redefined our understanding of a facility. We said, well, Building 239 isn't a facility. Building 239 is concrete and rebar and bricks, and it's not a facility. The facility is in the expertise and the people and the laboratories and the facilities, the equipment inside that brick and concrete and rebar. And security said, mm, you interest me strangely go on. And in the end, we accepted that definition, both sides, and we began to retrofit Building 239 so that all the internal doors were individually controlled with the electronic access badges. And that's how we created, inside the fence, a facility that has within it separable, controllable, secure areas so that the facility can accommodate the work of both UC folks and NASA folks. And that's the access agreement that we put in place. So once we had resolved that major significant problem, we moved on, negotiated the Space Act agreement, and began to bring on board affiliates, the Small, summer, the small Spacecraft Summer Study Project, uh, and a variety of other affiliates who are described on the next slide. So that's one of the core elements that demonstrates how the partners can compromise for one another's needs and must find these new solutions in order to make the partnership work. It was a challenge for NASA to do, but NASA could do it. And this was an area where the university was not able to compromise. And that could have been the definition of failure for the partnership early on. You had a question? What, how do you deal with foreign nationals' access to other buildings? Do you need for me to repeat questions since you're not using the... Okay, so the question is, how did we deal with foreign national access to other buildings? Foreign nationals don't have access to other buildings. Foreign nationals who are associated with the advanced studies labs have access to Building 239 and those areas that are operated by ASL within Building 239 and the cafeteria. That's the agreement. Uh, and so this is another, um, I suppose you could say, an accommodation from NASA that if folks with an ASL badge are found anywhere else, it breaches the agreement and it could threaten the whole partnership. So we go to great pains to instruct the folks that are associated with ASL, the leads for each individual partner and all of the individual staff and student members, what the restrictions are on access. Okay. 
So who are the partners? So these are our current eight partners. Um, and I actually, within the last week, had uh, applications from three more and interest from a fourth. So uh, in recent days, it's actually been growing very rapidly. The Let's see, what shall I do? On the next slide, I tell you a little bit about them, but let's just go through them. The Center for Nanostructures is from Santa Clara University. The Thermal Characterization Lab from the School of Engineering at Santa Cruz. Advanced Space Science and Technology Project is from your own Bin Chen, who was originally with SETI, but transferred her affiliation basis to UC Santa Cruz when she became an adjunct professor at Santa Cruz. There are reasons for that that I can answer if you're interested, but I won't go into it if you're not. The BioInfo Nano Research and Development Institute that I spoke about earlier. Nanostructured Energy Conversion Technology and Research, again, from the School of Engineering at Santa Cruz. The Advanced Prototypes Lab is a NASA project that's a member of the, um, it's a NASA project and many of the staff are staffed through the UARC. Center for Advanced Aerospace Materials and Devices, I suspect some of you will know this. This is the work of the um, nanotechnology group at, um, at Ames, Harry Partridge and his associates. And we've had two small spacecraft summer study projects. The first in 2007 was focused on developing a small spacecraft that would study the moon. And this year, the project was based on um, a small spacecraft, a nano spacecraft, that would characterize and land on a near-Earth asteroid. So there they are with their affiliations and their titles. And what do they do? Early on when we were defining what the advanced studies labs might do, I got advice um, from a variety of, of places. And one of, the, one of the most helpful discussions I had was with a, a colleague I'm sure many of you are familiar with, Dave Diemer at, um, at UC Santa Cruz. And Dave's perspective was that the advanced studies labs should identify a particular thrust area where it could invest and move the art stick forward. And I think that was wise advice. But at the time, I wasn't sure that I could define what that thrust area should be and know that I would have chosen correctly. So the alternative uh, advice was to look for serendipity, to be open to folks who wanted to join this kind of new partnership, who wanted to behave in a collaborative manner. The ASL is based on uh, folks sharing facilities and equipment and expertise. and let it evolve. Uh, and in a way, this goes back to advice that Barry Blumberg had for the Astrobiology Institute when he was director. He said, you don't, you don't mark out a path and pour concrete. You wait to see where people walk, and then you make it a path. So we ended up doing a combination of both. We started out really with the Blumberg serendipity approach, but always in the back of our minds, Deemer's advice of looking for a place where you can make a difference and where you're doing something unique. So as a result, where we are today, and this is uh, the Space Act Agreement was signed the 1st um, of February. So there was a lot of talk that happened before that, and there were a number of affiliate groups that joined before that. But so many of the activities had to wait until that formal legal structure was in place. We couldn't spend state money on the infrastructure and, on, and investing in the activity until that document was in place. So really, a lot of activity has happened only since February. So we have all of these groups. The um, top corner here is a representation of the Small Spacecraft Summer Study. And as I mentioned, this brought together uh, about 20 students who were from across the United States and f included foreign nationals and students who were from foreign universities. And they were resident in our facility for about a 10-week period working with the Mission Design Center at NASA Ames. And the principal investigator was Eric Asfog from UC Santa Cruz, who was joined by, as a co-PI, Greg Delory, who I saw was one of your previous speakers. Uh, Greg had been the principal investigator for the 2007 Small Spacecraft Summer Study Project, and Greg came back to work with Eric on this year's program. And in the 10 weeks, the students put together, through preliminary design, uh, preliminary design and critical design review process, a proposal for a mission to a near-Earth asteroid. And they're hoping to keep the group together um, subsequently and be able to polish that proposal up so that when there is an announcement of opportunity, this group 
of students will have a proposal ready to go into that announcement of opportunity to see if they can actually get their mission selected. And Bin Chen, of course, you know, and I've put her here with a, an image of the High Lakes Project and, and the patch. It's a project that she's collaborated with. I'm, I don't think that I really need to tell you about Bin Chen's work. So I think I'll let that go and let you ask questions if you need to, because I suspect I'd be just you know, preaching to the choir on what um, Bin Chen has been contributing, whether she's in her SETI Institute role or UC Santa Cruz role or, or NASA collaborator role. The BioInfo Nano Research and Development Institute uh, is funded through a congressional earmark to the NASA budget. It got funding in um, 2006, and there was one year when Congress didn't do earmarks. I think that was 2007. And it received funding again this year and is expecting to receive funding. It's, uh, the, of course, the budget hasn't been discussed much, let alone passed, the federal budget, but not the state budget either. Um, so they're expecting funding in 2009. The concept of the BioInfo Nano Research and Development Institute is to create a consortium co-laboratory that would include NASA projects, university projects, and industrial affiliates. And the initial concept was that the industrial affiliates would pay a membership fee, and using the membership fee and the combined monies, the institute would be able to acquire specialized instruments and facilities that each partner individually would be either unable to afford or unwilling to afford when um, there's a risk environment that you don't know if you're going to need that $2 million instrument in the long run. You don't know if it'll work out for your research or for your product line. You like to use it, but you don't want to buy the whole thing. So that was the concept for the BioInfo Nano Research and Development Institute. Uh, and at the moment, it's providing funding to several of the other Advanced Studies Laboratories partners. So the BioInfo Nano Research and Development Institute is funding for example, Dr. Nabi Kobayashi's work. Nabi is growing carbon nanowires, and his particular research interest is in decreasing the cost and increasing the efficiency of a variety of semiconductor devices, and moving away from standard semiconductor technology, which requires a very high quality silicon wafer substrate so that the carbon nanowires grow in a particular orientation, spatial orientation. His interest is to use amorphous silica and other materials as a substrate so that the carbon nanowires will not grow entirely in a unique orientation, but that um, through the variety of other treatments and materials manipulations that he is researching, they will be as effective as the very highly expensive uh, versions, but much, much cheaper and so much, much more accessible. That's one of his research interests. And the BioInfo Nano Research and Development Institute is also funding Professor Ali Shakuri. Um, Ali is also in the School of Engineering. Uh, Ali's research interests uh, include patents in uh, electrical work that um, translates, transfers thermal and electrical energy, exchanges thermal and electrical energy. Uh, so one of the things that he has patented are nano refrigerators. Uh, and the importance of the refrigeration is both to draw heat from one area in, uh, in a uh, nano circuit, and I, that, then it can either be converted into electricity, or by drawing the heat away from a particular area of the circuit, you increase the efficiency of the circuit, and you increase the lifetime of the circuit. You decrease the error rate of the circuit because it behaves better in a cooled environment. So those are among Ali's research interests. He's also creating a photovoltaic research facility, which will look very much like this. You don't have much scale here, but this is somewhere, this is about six to eight feet, and about four feet in this direction. It's about three to four feet off the ground. And something very much like this will be constructed outside of building 239, between the building and the parking lot. And we're in the process of helping Ali construct this facility. And it will be used for testing materials in this photovoltaic assembly, which will have a solar tracker so that, like a sunflower, it will track around the sun. So let's see, that's Ali, Bin, Chen. Um, down here is the Advanced Prototypes Labs. And Advanced Prototypes evaluates a variety of different technologies, optics, fluidics, biology, electronics, packaging and integration in, a, in an iterative process. They have discovered a number of years ago that when investigators are ready to fly experiments in space probes or in the shuttle or in the space station, that the development cycle for their unique work is very long. If NASA can evaluate the technologies that they may be able to use in advance, it will be able to pre-select and to start the investigator unique equipment 
five or six steps further along the road because they will already have done the pre-work. And that's what the Advanced Prototypes Lab does. It studies a variety of technologies and approaches so that they are ready and understood before the investigators even need them. That's why they're advanced. And the lead for this group is Linda Timchin, and Linda has just produced Lauren. So we hope to see her back in a couple of months. <laughs> And the nanotechnology R&D is a representation of the AIMS, um, Aerospace Materials and Devices Group, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. They have been growing current nanotubes, they've been adapting them to biological situations, putting them on atomic force microscopes so that one can evaluate at the nanoscale the nature of both biological and abiological materials. Um, they're looking into the, the processes of carbon nanotube growth to examine those at the chemical and physical level to improve processes. Uh, they're looking into nanopore separation technologies, creating biosensors using nanomaterials. So part of what I'm seeing here in the groups that have come to us that are looking for, sometimes there's Santa Cruz folks who are coming to Ames because they want to use some of the facilities available at Ames. So they have some built-in sense of collaboration. Sometimes there are folks that are brought in by Ames collaborators who have a research partner at a university so again, they have the underpinnings of a collaboration, and the Advanced Studies Labs is providing the infrastructure and the architecture to enable those interests to take the next step forward. And as we do that, we're blazing a trail through each of their individual issues. The first time we took on board a third-party affiliate from Santa Clara University, we figured out some things that relate to co-operating a facility with third parties, and I'm sure that when we take on board our first industrial partner, we'll find out some more interesting things about how to get these people all able to play together nicely. They're all willing to play together nicely. We have to enable them to do what they already want to do. And what I'm finding is that this group has expertise in nanotechnology, nanoengineering at the material science level, and they also, some of them have interests in developing instrumentation for space exploration, for space probes, for field studies, for planetary, for planetary exploration. And that's the angle of astrobiology that I hope to keep very firmly embedded in the Advanced Studies Lab. The building that we're a neighbor in with other NASA projects is one that contains astrobiology, bioengineering, nanoscience, or some earth observing science, astrophysics, uh, computational modeling. And if possible, I would like to see the Advanced Studies Labs grow up as a good neighbor to all of those activities and able to dynamically interact with all of those activities. It would be fabulous if the nanoengineering and material science and the astrobiology space exploration ends of this continuum developed deeper dialogues that enabled the development of smart materials that could be conformable materials and be the skin of space probes, self-cleaning space probes, self-diagnosing space probes, probes whose skins would be able to absorb radiation energy and store it, convert it into electrical energy, um, recover waste thermal energy, move it from one place to another and convert that into useful energy. Those would all be the kinds of advances that would really enable the next level of space exploration. So that could be what Dave Diemer described as the unique thrust that the Advanced Studies Labs might in the long run be able to have contributed to, and it would have come from the serendipity angle. So don't use this, use this. So this is the description of the best laid plans that we thought we'd move the fence, and you know there we would be excluded from the field center, and that didn't work out, and I think there's been a really good outcome from that not working out. Um, as part of our vision, putting these two organizations together, we want to make sure that what we create can be franchised, that what we create can have a life beyond, that there are lessons here for putting federal agencies and publicly supported state agencies together in a way that we could enable this to, to go further, to help uh, other areas, other segments of society make these kinds of partnerships and make them work. So we have an application procedure. We have information that's provided to applicants, and this is an internal um, sheet to track that um, the application is received. We have a liaison working group, which has representatives from all of our neighbors in the other um, branch organizations in Building 239 that we interact with to transfer information, make the activities of the Advanced Studies Lab transparent to them and have them participate in that. 
Uh, we also have an Ames point of contact and a UC Santa Cruz point of contact. So both of the primary partners in this bilateral agreement have visibility into who wants to be a member and a chance to discuss that. Uh, and in addition to the affiliation with the Advanced Studies Lab, I like to describe this as both the religious and the legal um, sides of a marriage. The religious side of the, and religious and emotional side of the marriage is for the affiliate to be a good match with where the ASL is and where it's going. When we, once we've determined that, the next level is to make a legal relationship that documents the relationship either between the university and this entity or between NASA and this entity, because that's how it belongs and is covered by various liability concerns, and it begins to get access to the various mechanisms that either parent organization has. So there is um, some documented relationship between the affiliate and one of these entities through a Space Act agreement or an annex, through an extended use lease agreement, through a cooperative agreement or grant, a contract, or it's, by definition, it's a NASA project, and that is its affiliation with the NASA parent organization. Okay, it's a, it's a partner to alliance, it's a consortium of affiliates. I've mentioned they're UC associated, NASA, they can be third parties or non-resident, and particularly with our ability to provide access for foreign nationals, this is very attractive for a variety of international partners who would like to come and use the, um, the shared offices and workshop and presentation spaces. And what we try to do is deliver unexpected solutions. We have an operations council. Uh, it's not exactly a democracy, because probably a democracy with scientists wouldn't work all that well. But it is, a, um, it is representational. So all of the principal investigators or the leads for all of the affiliates uh, are participate in the operations council and whatever others we need for any particular issue that we're talking about. We talk about mutually um, acquiring instrumentation, like electron microscopes was the purpose of this particular meeting. We try to provide benefits to the 239 community. Beverly McLeod is in the audience, the librarian in Life Sciences Library in Building 239. And Beverly and I have partnered on providing access to the UC Santa Cruz Library online search and retrieval for our neighbors in Building 239. So I, I opened up the possibility to do it. And Beverly has been managing the details of providing access and troubleshooting some of the issues. I have office hours every Thursday. I mentioned the liaison working group that gives transparent information flow. And this is uh, an example of our space plan. So these are the areas on the first floor of Building 239 that have become co-operated by ASL for NASA and UC as a result of the first chunk of space that was turned over in the Space Act Agreement. Um, and this is not exactly contiguous here, but this also on the first floor is a renovated area that used to be the um, Ames Human Bedrest Facility. Um, some of you are probably old enough or experienced, shall I say, experienced enough to remember when Ames was involved in doing human bed rest studies. There's also space that we call the common nano characterization facility in the basement of building 239. It's all this area, about almost 5,000 square feet, and several rooms on the second floor where the Center for Nanostructures has their labs and facilities, roughly another 1,000 square feet. And we have, a, as I mentioned, a couple of additional opportunities that we're evaluating. There is a sustainable water technology collaboration project, which involves the bioengineering branch at Ames, and a variety of um, institute for, um, I think it's the Institute for Water Qualities. There's the Demonstration Farm. Um, there's in the Environmental Sciences uh, Organization at UC Santa Cruz. Solar Energy and Renewable Fuels Laboratory from the School of Biological and Physical Sciences at Santa Cruz. Uh, a new startup company that would like to have um, spaces and possibly a collaboration with the International Space University activities because we do a number of uh, student programs. I mentioned the Small Spacecraft Summer Study. There is also a, a, um, a Danish California, actually, is more correct. Danish California Summer School on Renewable Concepts, Technology, and Policy in, in Energy. Uh, that took place this year, mostly funded by the Danish government and two Danish universities. And next year, they plan to double the size and have that school here at NASA Ames, and it will use the photovoltaic test bed. So there's a possibility of um, working with the International Space University, depending on their themes and their direction next year. So this is what I've shown you before. And if I have time and a show of interest, I'll tell you more about the NASA Research Park development, or you think? So here we have a very pretty um, Google Earth picture of um, Ames Research Center. UC proposes to lead the planning for creating this community 
that combines educational institutions and industrial partners and AIMS uh, to orient you. This is building 239. Here is building 19. And the main gate entrance, and gosh, you must be about there, probably. Uh, and the proposal is to develop this yellow highlighted area, or parts of it. Uh, no, I think I take that back. I think you'll see on the next slide. It's maybe, it may be here. Just an example of how it's not my project. So I mentioned the UARC. Um, you're f it's, oh, it's older than I thought. You're five of ten. These are Bill Berry's slides, not mine. And Silicon Valley Initiatives academic programs, engineering, computer science, and they're planning a future school of management. This is Building 19, most of you will recognize. Uh, so here's the proposed campus. Again, here's Building 19 and the historic area. This would be reserved for academic partners and academic spaces. This big area would be residential. And here we have industrial. And so the combination uh, provides an opportunity for unique partnerships. This is a pre-decisional, kind of a you know, conceptual drawing of what they plan to do out there. And on the 24th of March, these groups signed a letter of intent for co-developing this area. And I think that's pretty much all I had about it. So ASL has a website, and I encourage you to go there and check it out and see more. And I'd be happy to answer questions and hope that I've addressed what you might have been interested in. We're testing a new microphone <coughs> this Wednesday. Hopefully this is working. Uh, if you have any questions, raise your hand, and I'll present you with the microphone. Rose, on one of your earlier slides, you said explicitly this was a partnership between NASA and the UCSC campus. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I noticed that a, a few of your affiliates had other UC campuses. So to what degree is UCSC representing the broader UC community? It's not so much UC Santa Cruz representing the other community. The Space Act Agreement is written specifically as a partnership between the Santa Cruz campus and NASA Ames. In all the cases where there are faculty from other campuses involved, they're involved through a project that also primarily engages a Santa Cruz faculty member. So there is nothing that precludes other faculty members from being involved. But if, for example, a faculty member at uh, UCLA wanted to be the lead of a team affiliated with the Advanced Studies Labs, then we would, as we would with any other third party like Santa Clara University, we would help them by taking the, the Space Act agreement that exists between Santa Cruz and Ames as a template and help them create a parallel Space Act agreement between UCLA and NASA Ames. They would need to do that if they did not have a Santa Cruz affiliation. Uh, and if that happened probably one more time, then I would suspect that we would go back and revise the Space Act agreement so that it would in fact represent all 10 campuses. But at the moment, the, the first one is specific to Santa Cruz. And of course, as an employee of the University at Santa Cruz, I'm thrilled beyond words about that. Uh, Rose, is that why Bin Chen had to uh, have an affiliation with uh, Santa Cruz to carry out her work? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first is, part. Is that why Bin Chen had to uh, ha become an adjunct professor uh, at Santa Cruz? No, uh, that was in work be before um, for, for other reasons that, that are personal to her. When, when Bin was affiliated through her SETI Institute relationship, SETI has a Space Act agreement with NASA Ames, but it's non-reimbursable. A lot of the spaces within ASL are designed for people to share and collaborate in, and those areas don't have any cost associated with them. So Bin could become an affiliate of ASL, as indeed she did. The Space Act agreement that existed between SETI and NASA supported her involvement, and you know, if she slipped and fell, any of those liability issues. But because it didn't provide for any reimbursable relationship, she could only have access to those areas within ASL that were designed to be shared, that were available to everybody. If she wanted to have an area where she would install her, her own equipment, even though those areas too are shared, the expectation is that the investigators within ASL will open their doors to other colleagues, NASA colleagues, whether or not they're associated with ASL, other UC colleagues who may come in as guests, and certainly other ASL um, sister projects 
would have access to that space, that area, and the equipment that's in there. Maybe not everything. Some equipment may not be appropriate for sharing. But when we look at the first application from affiliates, one of the areas that we're looking for is what do they bring? And it needn't necessarily be equipment. It can be equipment. It can be unique facilities that they're going to contribute. It can be expertise. It can be access to students. But there must be uh, areas where each partner contributes to the whole. So for BIN to bring in things and install unique equipment that she would then make available to other folks, that required having the option of a reimbursable relationship. And SETI wasn't interested, nor need they be, in renegotiating their Space Act agreement to make it reimbursable. So BIN fortunately had the option, since she was already uh, undertaking to become an adjunct professor at Santa Cruz. When that was approved, she could choose to switch her affiliation to be under the umbrella of the UC Santa Cruz Space Act Agreement, which was reimbursable, or to stay under the umbrella of the SETI Institute, and she chose to move it. That's why. Frank? Are there any uh, staff positions, are there any staff, staff scientist positions at ASL that are paid by ASL? Scientists? No. Uh, so all scientists are? They come from these other organizations. other places. Yes, there could be, but there are not at the moment. Uh, another could be possibility, and I, I find this aspect quite exciting. It is possible for the advanced studies labs to become a 501c3, a real independent legal entity with a parent organization probably would be UC Santa Cruz. And the regents have blown hot and cold on uh, 501c3 organizations as spin-offs of, of university activities. And at the moment, I understand they're at least not blowing cold. I don't know that they're blowing hot. But it wouldn't be an impossible thing to do. And if one were able to do that, then ASL as a nonprofit could be, could, uh, could handle funds. Uh, under those circumstances, a particular advantage that could accrue to NASA Ames is through the IPA process. It's possible to IPA to loan through an inter interagency personnel assignment to loan a civil servant to another organization, like an academic or a not-for-profit research organization. When that's done, it can be done for any 100% time or any portion of time. It can be done for 20% time, 80% time. It's up to the two organizations to make an agreement. And either the gaining or the losing organization can pay. So if ASL was a 501c3, conceptually, a civil servant could be loaned to it, could be IPA'd, assigned to that nonprofit for 20% of their time. They could write a grant to the National Science Foundation uh, that would include 20% of their salary. And if that grant is successful, then the grant would be awarded to ASL as the organization. ASL would pay their salary for that percentage of time. They're still a civil servant. The other 80% is paid for by NASA. It would be a way, and it's the only way I've ever heard of, and we haven't done it. Nobody's done it. So until you try, you don't really know if it would work. But on paper, it looks like that would be a way of enabling NASA civil servants to achieve productive funding that covers their salary support from other federal agencies. And that would be a, a potentially a really exciting thing to do. Even though it's a fiscal thing, it's hard for me to say, you know, to back it, it'd be really exciting. But you know, it would. That would be a very unusual, because NASA always has had this position of being a very, uh, of being very embedded in being fundamental research. Uh, that's what NASA Ames sees itself as doing in a very core way. But because of the uh, occasional vicissitudes of NASA headquarters funding, it's very difficult to maintain that level of expertise. And having them associated with the university has been tried and is a good thing, but it often doesn't allow them through an adjunct professorship to be paid at the level that they are as civil servants. So they don't want to leave their civil service, but as a civil servant they can't accept other federal funding. For so that could be a really interesting outcome one day. Have any of uh, your members up to this time had any need or interest in facilities at Ames but outside of 239? Or, or maybe do you anticipate that they could? We anticipate that they would, and some of them have had interest in that. It was um, challenging for the small spacecraft summer study students who were foreign nationals and who were not able to physically go to the Mission Design Center because their ASL badges don't permit that. So that's been a challenge. Uh, I think the n one of the next things that I would try to negotiate with Ames, since they've enabled not only access to Building 239 but to the cafeteria, 
which was rather a nice thing. I, I didn't actually ask for it because, as you know, I don't go to the cafeteria. Uh, but it was uh, the various Ames people on that negotiating table that thought, well, you know, people need to eat, so we should let them go to the cafeteria. I'm not sure that it was a smart thing, and I don't encourage people to go to the cafeteria. But to be able to go to the main auditorium would be nice. There have been a number of very interesting lectures, and of course there always are. Like uh, you've exchanged Seth for me today. Seth is over at, at, at Ames talking. I'm not sure you got the better part of that deal. But it would not be possible for ASL people to go over to the main auditorium to see Seth. So I think that that's probably something that we can fix in the next round of negotiations. And there is talk about extending at Ames the ASL concept to other buildings and having ASL facilities, uh, ASL activities, cooperated UC Santa Cruz ASL activities in other buildings besides 239, but it hasn't happened yet. You have a question, Noana? Yes, um, for partnerships, um, is there a, a common thread that makes them successful or unsuccessful besides the common interest and contribution? Mm -hmm. So that I'm thinking, is there, what does it take to keep a partnership like that going mm -hmm. when, whenever they push each other limits? It, it really is at this level of um, operating beyond your comfort zone. So organizations who have experience in doing partnerships, and how you get experience is really just hanging in there, but organizations that have experience in doing partnerships recognize that a partnership stretches their comfort boundaries. They don't undertake them unless they're internally very convinced that what they want out of the partnership, that their goal is so important that being uncomfortable is worth it. And then they go into it with that mindset. And the first couple of times, it's very much a learning process. Generally, organizations are, are unaccustomed to that, and they don't expect that outcome. Uh, and then it's kind of hit or miss whether they hang in long enough, whether the goal is important enough to withstand the discomfort, and how, how much it's um, an ongoing irritation versus an incident, an incident that's really uncomfortable and typically that will be what, what kills a partnership. It, you can undergo a lot of irritation for a fairly long period of time without giving up, especially if what you're looking forward to, the light at the end of the tunnel, is worthwhile. But there are sometimes incidents that happen that, um, that just get worse and worse and worse. And, and oftentimes, the people involved get to a point where they can't talk with each other anymore, and, and then the partnership dissolves. So it's really the experience of being willing to stay in uncomfortable places and find uncomfortable solutions because the goal is really important to you. Um, and Big companies that do this all the time will typically have internal training that, that exchanges that information from one successful partnership to the next, so that the next one does anticipate that and has put in place ways of dealing with those issues. Sometimes they even have uh, internal organizations that specialize in doing partnerships that maintain the continuity of that mindset. So in this particular instance between NASA and UC, um, there, there is a lot of pervasive awareness of a desire to do partnerships, and so that's supportive. There has been very strong support from the top leadership in both organizations, and that has helped through some of the little irritations and some of the incidents to be able to say, you know, Pete Warden wants this to happen. I'm sorry to tell you, but Pete wants it to happen. Now can we sit down and redefine where the problem is and find some solutions? And sometimes just that helps refocus people. And there is a strong tendency after you walk away from the table with what you think is a solution for people to go back to their normal work environment and in that milieu, everybody they interact with reinforces their old attitude and your agreement may erode. So you go back to the table and you do it again. It's, it's a continuous process. Uh, and I think having at least a small core of people or at least one who's willing to stay there at the table is, is key. If you didn't have that, then the two organizations would fly off and spin off in their own previous directions pretty quickly. Rose, so um, for a, <coughs> a SETI PI who's interested in doing work with the ASL, it, it seems a prerequisite is, is having uh, a linkage into Santa Cruz uh, and having somebody in Santa Cruz to partner with. Are there any um, initiatives coming out of the ASL to encourage those partnerships any, any more uh, presenting? Well, here, here's uh, one. My first initiative was to wait until you invited me to come and give a talk. That was pretty smart of me. <laughs> um, it's, it's, not exactly tr it's not really true that you have to have a, a relationship with Santa Cruz. Uh, SETI Institute investigator has previously been a lead affiliate, uh, and, that was, and that was Bin Chen. So there are a variety of 
uh, areas where you can take advantage of what the ASL can do without having a relationship with Santa Cruz or without modifying your existing Space Act agreement. And we've done that before. And we would welcome that. And I think it's a good place to start because if you get your, if you get your feet wet in figuring out exactly what ASL can do for you at the, at the beginning level, at the first step, and then you're able to better articulate what it is that you want next that might require a, a different Space Act agreement or an affiliation with Santa Cruz. Um, you know, then you're already one step ahead about what it is you want. And it certainly is possible for SETI to renegotiate, renegotiate its Space Act agreement or negotiate a new one and make it reimbursable, which would open a variety of other doors for you directly with, with the ASL. But as in terms of initiatives, you know, since we signed the Space Act Agreement in February, I have pretty much been um, treading water to keep my head above it to get all of the things in place that are necessary for uh, creating operations manuals that instruct people who are not from within the NASA system in how you get a lab operational at NASA, in lab safety plans, how do you order chemicals and get hazardous materials and equipment delivered when you're ordering it through the university but it's delivered at NASA, a whole variety of details as well as trying to keep up the consistency of the documents and the strategic plan and things like that. So um, we haven't done a lot of outreach and yet folks keep coming to us um, which also leads to a certain complacency of thinking, well, you know, I don't need to do any outreach. The people who are coming to me, I'm filling me up. And they seem to be very high quality people with nice synergies with the existing groups, but that's just a bad, complacent attitude. And, and may I ask uh, how long an average uh, contract is with ASL? Uh, do the, is there a time, time limit built into each contract, or is it? will reassess in three years? It's, it's not a contract. So the relationship is an affiliation. And since ASL is not currently a 501c3, for example, we don't have a legal standing to even make contracts with you. So it's, it's an affiliation. It wouldn't, any, no affiliation would go longer, could possibly go longer than the current term of the Space Act Agreement that is the primary relationship between the two core partners. Uh, and that, let's see, it was signed uh, February 1, 2008, so it goes to January 31st, 2010. So no relationship would, you know, ipso facto, is that the right thing? To go beyond that. And we evaluate how the relationship is working for all sides, the partner and UC and NASA and the other, about annually. But we haven't had an about annually happen yet. So the plan is uh, in, the, in the winter, to develop the approach to interrogating ourselves internally and looking at the eight groups and maybe the more that, that join and asking, you know, did this relationship work? You know, you said you were going to bring in these kinds of things and have a collaboratory attitude and you were going to make these, this equipment available. Did that happen? And was it good for you? Did you find things to do here that were useful? And some groups may very well find that what they thought was going to work out as a collaboration didn't, and they may go away, and then space will be available for other ones. I think that's uh, it, it's an issue that we're going to have to deal with when we get a little bit more mature, is how to deal with that kind of turnover. Okay. That looks there's, like it, and it's probably time. There's no time, further so questions. If you'll I join me. Thank you for your attention. It was really pleasant to be with you guys again. Uh, next week, we also have uh, Lynn Kaminsky from uh, Sonoma State, and she's going to talk to us about GLASS, which is getting a new name on the day before her talk. So she'll be able to talk, tell us all about that. It should be very interesting. Thanks very much.